Good evening, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So for announcements this evening, um, tomorrow evening we have youth here at the church at 6.30. And then Monday afternoon, or Monday lunch is prayer, of course. And Tuesday evening at 7.30 is Bible study. Um, I really don't have a lot to update you guys on what's going on. I'm assuming that a lot of you are following that WhatsApp link that Jay had posted on WhatsApp. Um, it's kind of keeping you up to date on what they're doing over there. Um, they, so Jay and another of the guys, Anthony was his name, they have been kind of separated from the other eight all week. And they have been in Odessa with Pastor Vit Vitali, kind of running things on that end of it. And then the other eight guys are in that small town just right over the Ukraine border. Um, you you, you me ill or something like that. Anyway, and so they've been kind of doing um, things down there. So let's see, you know, they're sleeping now, so... Um, Jay said they were going to, him and Anthony were going to get up early tomorrow morning and they're going to boogie to UKL or whatever it was, which is like three and a half hours away. They're going to get with the rest of the guys and then they are headed to Bucharest, Romania. And Monday morning, boom, they are on a flight. I'm just a little bit excited, that's all. They're having lots of fun and you know what? These guys are going to come back changed. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it because, you know, just some of the things that Jay is sharing, he's like, whoa. Like, today, him and Anthony were with, I don't, I don't know who, Pastor Vitali. He said it was a friend of Pastor Vitali's. They went to this, I, I can see the, the name of the town on the map. It started with an M, but anyway. And he said it was really, it was really the front lines of where the fighting was and they were talking with soldiers and they prayed with them and gave them seven boxes of medical supplies and um the he said the one soldier was like you know he's like we need we need body bags that's kind of like <laughs> he's like they were just putting them in this building and it was like they're starting to stack up. And it's like, wow, I don't have a revelation of that. Like, that seems so foreign and so, like, and he's like, you know, the media tries to say that, oh, there's not a lot happening over there. You know, there's not a lot of casualties. And, but he's like, there is there. And he's like, what they're doing is, like, they're really raising up Minutemen. And he's like, we need helmets and we need vests so that we can equip these minute men with to be successful and so I was like I was talking with Jay and I was like well that just takes everything to another level I mean we're not I mean that's a whole nother level because like it's one thing to hand out food and water and gauze and you know bandages you know that's fairly easy to get a hold of but you know when you're talking about like helmets and vest and like body bags you know that's a whole nother thing anyway so he he jay was really today was a great day they had a great day they had a great he's like he's like basically what i'm doing he's like i'm building relationships and making connections which is what he does really good and he's like because you know we're looking at this long term we're not looking at just this one trip and you know, obviously we want to do a lot of good this one trip, but he's like, you know, we're looking, how can we help you in the future? You know, what do you need moving forward? So, Monday they head out from Bucharest, Romania, and I think they fly right into Istanbul again, and then it's a straight flight to America. And then I think the three guys get here in Montrose, Tuesday at lunch. Yay! <laughs> uh, 
Yes, thank you, Kim. Excitement understood. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> anybody need an offering envelope? If you do, raise your hand. And so, praise God. Well, I'm going to be talking about alms tonight. So if you want, you can turn with me to Matthew 6. I guess kind of where I'm still going with is what, you know, two weeks ago I started on talking about expectation, like God wants us to expect, you know. Last week I talked about what we can expect when we tithe. So I'm going to kind of go into some scriptures that what we can expect when we give alms, which is kind of interesting. You know, if you've given into the Ten Men Project, that's giving alms. <laughs> so, praise God. I mean, it's not that we give to rub God the right way so he gives back. That's not the point or how we should be given, but there's still scripture and promises that we can see and we can expect in our giving. So Matthew 6, 1 through 4 is where I'm going to be going to first. Of course, it start, I'm sure many of you have read this before. Verse 1 starts, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have your, no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou dost thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So apparently they had guys out in front, you know, tooting the horn. do 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 <laughs> You know, as they gave to the poor, it's like, wow. And uh, now this is kind of, I'm not sure what word to use here. It says, when thou dost thine alms. It's like a given of that. You are, this is something you're doing. So verse 3, but when thou dost alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand does. This is, saying that, this is not saying you should stick your left hand in your pocket as you give it out with your right hand. It's saying that not to brag about it or, you know, tote it around. It's, and some of it, what I believe it is, is to protect the people you're given to, their dignity. You know, if they're in, you know, sh- bad time of their life. Verse 4 says that thine alms may, in seek, may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward you openly. God will reward you openly. This is what this is saying. So, I'm going to go to Psalms, some scriptures, but just setting the stage or hear that, that this is something that God sees us doing, like when you do it, and then let's go to, actually first I'm going to go to Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse 27, I should have put bookmark in here, okay, 28, verse 27, says, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. If you, in your alms given, if you've given to the poor, you shall not lack. You can, this is a promise, you will not lack. Then Proverbs 22.9 goes kind of with this. Proverbs verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 9. says, he that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth to his bre- giveth of his bread to the poor. So if you have a bountiful eye, you shall be blessed. This is in connection with giving to the poor of your bread or your income or your your means. And let's go to Psalms forty one. Psalms 41. So, I have like six points or 
the first one would be, would go with those other scriptures, it says, you shall not lack of the, what you can expect. You shall not lack. You know, we have scripture in Matthew, that says, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. So, Psalms 41, one, verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. I'm just going to read on through verse 3. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. So here again we have, it says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. And I should have looked up that word in the Hebrew, I forgot, but it's not just about thinking upon them, but actually I believe what he's saying is like helping them out, taking care of the poor. So I've got two. The second point here would be the Lord would deliver in time of trouble. This goes right with what in the New Testament says, give and he shall give. You know, As you give, he, he takes care of you. The Lord will deliver in time of trouble. Then number three, He'll preserve you and keep you alive, which we find in verse 2. So he'll preserve you and keep you alive. I have to think about Psalms 91, you know. That's some good scripture to, to speak over yourself, like, if you're in the shadow of the Almighty, you know, he'll keep the evil from coming nigh you. Then number four is blessed upon the earth. You will be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Number five, not be delivered to enemies. (laughs) You will not be delivered to your enemies. This is not just necessarily physical enemies either. This can be, well, I was going to say like human enemies. Yeah, physical, like sickness or, or lack. You will not be delivered to your enemies. And number six, he goes on here in verse three, he says, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. So I've got number six, strengthen you and turn the bed of sickness. That word make, I looked up, it could mean turn. He will turn it, and there's healing here in this scripture is what I'm seeing. So if this is in your life, you know, strengthen you upon the bed of language. He will strengthen you on your, on the bed, you know, your bed of sickness. Which I hope that's not your case, but if it does, (laughs) praise God. Hallelujah. Um, So, if you do this in secret, like in Matthew 6 it says, he will reward you openly. Hallelujah. That's where I'll, I'll leave that at. So, Oh, Curtis, you want to pass offering buckets? I didn't think about getting somebody else to start that tonight. But um, If you want to, you can get up with me and we will lift our offerings to the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can worship you again in this way, in our tithes and offerings, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is, you have promised that when we give, you give back abundantly, good measure, shaken together and running over, that men pour into our bosoms, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. (laughs) It's good even if it's just two. (laughs) Hallelujah. Anointing was still there. Hallelujah. Anyway, I won't hold up Ron any longer. (laughs) Come on up, Ron. Good evening. It's wonderful that you're all out tonight to praise and worship the Lord and stand in agreement for those who are traveling and blessing many other people. Uh, Thanks again for the privilege 
uh, the Church of the Word, Jay and Kim, for giving me the privilege of being able to share the Word of God. Anytime you can share the Word of God, that's a great honor and it's a great privilege, and I thank you for that privilege. Um, tonight we're 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 talking about the power of belonging. Power of belonging. Amazing how all the scriptures, the songs that we're reading, we were see, reading scripture tonight, praying scripture and singing scripture, uh, all goes along with what we're talking about tonight, the power of belonging. And um, so we're doing a series about abiding in Christ. And one of the most important things about abiding in Christ is that it teaches us that we belong, that we belong in the kingdom of God. And so I just want to take a moment as I lead us in prayer. But I'd like for you, you're sit down, you're relaxed. I'd like for you to just open up your heart to Jesus. Because Jesus is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And just for a moment, just open up your heart to Jesus. To, to just lift him up in your heart. To exalt him in your heart, to praise Him. He's the creator of the whole universe. There is nothing that has been created that Jesus Christ did not create, whether visible or invisible. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the universe. He is the healer. He is the provider. He's the protector. He is all things to all people. He is almighty. He is all-powerful. And there is no one greater than Jesus Christ. He is God. He is almighty God. He's been given the name. Jesus has been given the name that is above every name. There's no other name greater than his name. And that every knee must bow at that name in heaven and earth and under the earth. And because Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He is the Lord. He is the Lord Almighty. The Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He is love. He is the perfect reflection of the Father. And when we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we know Jesus, we know the Father. Because Jesus only glorifies the Father in everything He does. He is to be praised. Jesus is to be praised. Jesus is to be exalted. Jesus is to be glorified and honored and praised. From the depth of our hearts, let Him be praised. Let Him be exalted from the bottom of your heart. So Father God, we just thank You this evening for this time to lift up Jesus, to lift up Your kingdom. Because where Jesus is, Your kingdom is. And so we just, we acknowledge the Lord of our life tonight. We praise Him. And Father, we just pray that Jesus Christ will be praised tonight, that He will be honored and He will be glorified, not just with our mouth, not just with our minds, but that our very hearts will praise the name of Jesus. We thank You, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So allow me to share with you again, abiding in Christ, John 15, 1. I am... The true vine, Jesus says. And my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, He he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because the word I have spoken to you Remain in me, 
and I will remain in you. Abide in me. Live in me. If you will live in me, I will live in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. It must remain in the vine. It must live in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. If a man remains, if he lives, if he abides in me and I live in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me and, and he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain, abide, live in me, and my words live in you, abide in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Hallelujah. Amen. Bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. So apart from Christ, we can do nothing. But if I abide in Christ, it settles our position in our hearts that we belong to Christ. It settles it in our heart. It establishes, as I abide in Christ, it establishes that I am one with Christ and Christ is one with me. The Lord gave me this story a long time ago about, about a king. And this king of this kingdom found out that he had a son that he wasn't aware of, and that son was living in an orphanage. And so that king went to the orphanage, and he found the son, and he took the son, and he brought him back into the kingdom. He was about 10, 12 years old. And he brought him back into the kingdom, and he said, Son, you are my son, and because you are a son... The kingdom belongs to you just like it belongs to me. Everything in this kingdom is now yours. How wonderful is that? The son had been given everything. But the problem is, even though he's in the kingdom, he's still thinking like an orphan. He's still thinking in lack. He's still thinking that he has to hide food under the bed. He's still doing all those things that he did in the orphanage because it hasn't settled in his heart that he's been given ownership to the kingdom, that he belongs, that he belongs in that kingdom and that he can take ownership of that kingdom. You know, many Christians have been given everything, yet they still do not believe that they belong. They still haven't taken ownership of the kingdom that God has given them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 4, it says the weapons that we fight with, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world, on the contrary, they have divine power. The Word of God has divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. See, the strongholds from many Christians carry in their hearts is a spirit of unworthiness. They carry within them a spirit that I'm not sure if I belong or not. Our experience in this world says I don't deserve 
the riches of heaven. Just like that orphan. That orphan says, I don't deserve to be a king. I don't deserve the blessings of kingdom. Because of our past behavior, our present behavior, the world and the devil is telling us you're not worthy. That's a stronghold. That's a stronghold is when you believe a lie to be true. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21, he addresses this. He says, once you were alienated from God. One time you were alienated from God. There was a time that you were separated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. There was a time that you were separate from God because of your evil behavior. But now, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's who you are in the kingdom of God. You are holy in His sight. You are without blemish, free from accusation. You are totally loved. You're totally accepted. Belonging because of what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. Amen to that? It is settled in heaven, but we have to get it settled in our heart. Amen to that? It's settled in heaven... But we got to get it settled in our heart. I need to know, I need revelational knowledge that I belong to the kingdom of heaven. I need revelational knowledge. What is that? When I know and I believe spiritual truths in the depth of my heart, even though my circumstances are screaming that I'm unworthy of the kingdom of God, but the, my, the, heart, my, the word of God in my heart the Word is my evidence. The Word of God is my evidence that I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm forgiven, and I'm blessed in the kingdom of God. And that Word of God tells me that. The test is, do I know I belong to God and His kingdom in the depth of my heart? Do I have revelational knowledge? Do I really know in the depth of my heart? Have I taken ownership? Have I taken... Just like that orphan that comes into the kingdom. You know that orphan, he might be there a few months. He might be there a couple years. But I guarantee in 10 years after he's been in that kingdom, he's taken ownership. Say Amen. He abided in the kingdom. And because he abided in the kingdom, he began to take ownership because he knew he belonged, you see. And so we have to abide in the kingdom, in Christ, so that we can take ownership. Many people are waiting for revelational knowledge that they belong. The truth is revelational knowledge already belongs is waiting on you to find it. It's waiting on you. Many people are waiting for God to reveal to them. They're looking for a sign. But God is waiting for you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Last week, Kim gave such a great... She brought an example of revelational knowledge. A great word picture about students who were getting their driver's license, if you don't mind me using your example. Uh, it was a beautiful example because it was about them getting their driver license book and studying their book and becoming efficient and studying the book and knowing the book, what it says, and how to drive and everything. They, they pass the test, and so now they get their temporary, but true revelational knowledge doesn't take place until they get behind the wheel. <laughs> until they get behind the wheel and they get behind the wheel all at once 
Do I know it or do I not? It is when we start exercising our purpose and power and authority in the kingdom. See, that orphan, if he's not exercising the authority of the kingdom, he doesn't know that he belongs. If he's not exercising the authority of the kingdom, he's not, he's not confident that he has ownership. John 8, 31, 32 says, If you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I have to back up, because, because I'm thinking about that revelational knowledge, and do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know you're a son of God? Do you understand your position? Uh, that's the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Joshua 1.8, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Let the word of God, meditate on the word of God day and night so that you'll be careful to do everything written in it. Psalms 1, 2 and 3. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And on his, on his law he meditates day and night. Are we meditating on the Word of God day and night? Are we taking ownership of it? He is like a tree planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season, and those and whose leaves does not wither, whatever he does prospers. So tonight, we're going to be looking at who you are in Christ. And so let's just pray. Let's ask God. Give us a deeper revelation tonight of who we are. Amen. Father God, I just thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy, and I thank you for your love. And Father God, we just pray for a deeper revelational knowledge. We pray for greater wisdom and understanding. We want to know in the depth of our heart who we are so that we will exercise and put to practice our very identity that you've given us, sons of God. We thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name, amen. In Galatians chapter 3, in Galatians chapter 3, all these things I'm sharing with you, I know you already know them, but wouldn't it be awesome if you got it down in your heart tonight? Galatians 3, 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So how are you sons of God? You're sons of God by faith. You're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? God says, I, I want you to be baptized in water so that you have a physical evidence of the death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? And that's what that water baptism is. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection. And everyone who is pursuing Christ, should seek water baptism because of that physical... What is it? It's evidence that you belong. I've seen people accept Jesus in their heart, but it wasn't until they were baptized in water that they really settled in their heart that they were born again. You know? You need those physical evidences. And he goes on, he says, For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one. There is no segregation in the kingdom of God. Say amen to that. No segregation. We're all the same in Christ Jesus. And then he says something very important. He says, if you belong, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs According to the promise. If you belong, you know the promises of God are yours. Look at 4.4. But when the time had fully come, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive full rights as sons. I have full rights as a son of God. Will you say that with me? I have full rights as a son of God. That's right. You, have, you don't have partial rights. You didn't get a fringe of it. 
You got it all. Say amen to that. I've got full rights as a son of God. Because you are sons, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into my heart. God has sent the Spirit of Jesus into my heart. We say that with me? God has sent the Spirit of Jesus into my heart. I got the Spirit of Jesus in me. Amen. <laughs> That's what I have. Hallelujah. And he goes on further and he says, uh, Hallelujah. Because, uh, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave. You're no longer an orphan. Because the people of this world are orphans. The people of this world live in lack. The people of this world are hopeless. They're selfish because they have no one can take care of them. But we have a king. King Jesus. Amen to that. And King Jesus watching over and is caring for you. He says, you're no longer a slave, but you are a son. He's, he says it over and over and over again. That you're a son, and since you're a son, God has made you an heir. You're an heir with Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ because of what Jesus did. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Praise be... Verse 3, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has past tense blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spirit. I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Will you say that with me? I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Hallelujah! I ain't going to get it. I got it. Amen to that. I got that. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. And he goes on, for he chose us. I'm chosen. Will you guys say that with me? I am chosen. He has chosen us. Hallelujah. He has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God has called me to be holy and blameless in his sight. Say that with me. God has cho chosen me to be holy and blameless. That's how God sees me. Amen. Oh, I'm part of the club. Hallelujah. Jesus club. The kingdom club. Hallelujah. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glory. It pleases God that you're his child. It, he predestined you to be his child. It's not like this, this bothers him. <laughs> <laughs> it pleases him. He's been planning for you to be his children. It pleases him according to his will, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. I am forgiven of all my sins by the blood of Jesus. Say that with me. I have been forgiven of all my sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sins in accordance with His riches of God's grace that He has lavished on us with all. God loves blessing us. He loves lavishing on us the grace. Now look at verse 11. In Him we also were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. This is His will. This is exciting because it's God's will. And listen to what He says. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory, and you also were included. I'm included. Will you say that with me? I am included. Hallelujah. You were included. Ah, that's powerful. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed. I believe. Say that with me. I believe. Amen. You were marked in Him with the seal the promised Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this is a guarantee. It's a down deposit. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, The seal is the anointing of God. 
You have the anointing of God. The Bible says that you have the anointing on you. And the anointing doesn't come and go. But the anointing remains on you. Say amen to that. That's so cool. It's so wonderful to see God has given you a seal of ownership, the Holy Spirit, that guarantees your inheritance. It guarantees that you belong. Amen? It guarantees that you have possession, that you, you, you have ownership. You have ownership in the kingdom of God. You see, God is wanting us to take ownership. Say that with me. God is wanting us to take ownership. Powerful. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who God's possession, who are God's possession. I am God's possession. Say that with me. I am God's possession. I belong to the Lord, to the praise of His glory. It glorifies Him that I belong to Him. Amen. Let's look at verse 17 there. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You know, I know that that orphan, when he left the orphanage and he knew how people used him and abused him and took, you know, and then he came into the kingdom and I know he's thinking there, can I really trust this guy? Can I, I don't, the guy... I didn't even know who he was a few moments ago. Now, can I trust him? Can, can, I really, can I really trust him? See, God is asking us to ask for spiritual wisdom and revelation so that we can know God better. So that you can, can you trust him? Do you know that God's always going to do what he says he did? That he keeps his promises, you see? See, I need to know that in my heart, that, that, I, can, that I can step out in faith and know that he's going to show up. We got to say amen to that. I got to trust him. And he's saying you got to pray for spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better. You can know. You can know in the depth of your heart that no matter what's going on in your world, Jesus, the Lord, is with you. Father is with you. Holy Spirit is with you. He goes on to say, I pray also that the eyes of my heart may be enlightened or in order that you may know the hope. Do you see? Are you seeing this? God wants us to know what we have. And he says, I'm praying that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you can know the hope. Sorry, I don't mean to get holler. I just, it's a bad habit. Uh, to know the hope to which you've been called to, the riches of, of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We, we, God wants us to know. He wants us to know. The Bible tells us that the, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us what God has freely given us. Say amen to that. To reveal to us what God has freely given to us. And he goes on to say, Incomparable, and he goes on to say, riches of his glorious inheritance and his incomparable great power. Did you know that when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, he gave you that power? You already have that power. See, when you, when you know you, you belong, you will begin exercising that power. You use that power. If you're waiting for the power, it's never going to show up. You've already been given the power. And his incomparable great power. So God wants you to know that's the same power. He's going to go on here. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living inside of you. Amen to that? That power that is like the working of his mighty strength with the exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given in this life and the life to come. Now look over into chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, but because of his great love for us. Say that with me. Because of his great love for me. Because of his great love for me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up. Say that with me. I've been raised up. (laughs) I've been raised up. Hallelujah. I've been raised up and seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I am seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We say that with me. I am seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's your house. That's your home. That's where you live. And so we got to get that revelational knowledge in our heart. See, our home's in heaven. That's where we live. Praise be the name of the Lord. Um, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Romans 8, 1. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? If you're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you judge yourself unworthy, you are condemning yourself. When you're measuring, when we're measuring ourselves with others, when we're measuring ourselves according to rules and regulations rather than knowing a relationship with God and Christ, that we've been sealed in Christ and that in Christ I am complete. The Lord told me to talk to your hearts tonight. Because I know I can get on the stage and scream, no condemnation. There's no condemnation. Because the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. When we compare ourselves with other people, when we try to measure up to other people, we're lining ourselves up for condemnation. When we are judging ourselves based on what the world says, on rules and regulations, whether I broke that rule. The Bible clearly says if you sin, confess your sin, and he who is faithful and just will forgive you and purify you from all unrighteousness. But when you're measuring yourself up day after day and you're bringing condemnation in your life because you're not living up to what you think you need to be living, you're, not, you're, not fr- you're grieving the Holy Spirit. I know that you didn't want to hear that. I know you didn't want to hear that. But when you're living in condemnation of yourself, when you're condemning yourself over things that nobody else knows you're condemning yourself, you're grieving the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has made you free of condemnation. Will you guys say amen to that? I'm just really trying to talk to your heart tonight. The Holy Spirit has asked me to specifically set you free from condemnation. To ask yourself, to revisit because Jesus Christ is enough. Will you guys say that with me? Jesus Christ is enough. The blood of Jesus is enough. Say that with me. The blood of Jesus is enough. I am free from condemnation. 
That's right. I am free from condemnation. So when you say I'm free, that's when you're really free. Is when you are free from judging yourself unworthy, beating yourself up, saying that I need to, you know, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Well, that's the gospel. You're not enough. Jesus is. Amen? <laughs> Jesus is. Rest in that, okay? So there, there's no condemnation. That's who you are. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. He set me free from judging myself, condemning myself, unworthy. Hallelujah. Romans 8.15 says... For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit. God's spirit speaks to my spirit and says, Hello, son. Amen to that. The Holy Spirit says, hello, son. Hallelujah. God, that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Look at Romans uh, <clears throat> chapter 8, verse 28. We're almost finished here. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you love Him? Have you been called according to His purpose? If you love Him and you've been called according to His purpose, everything works for good. It doesn't matter how bad it looks, how ugly it is, guess what? It's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to work out for good. Why? Because He loves His children. That's powerful. And we know, and we know it. Where do we know? We know it in our heart. Oh, it sure looks bad, but it sure is good. Because <laughs> it's going to work out for good. Because God is for me. Go on there. He says, uh, called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. And to be conformed into the likeness of his son. God's intent was that we would look like Jesus. Live like Jesus. Talk like Jesus. Do what Jesus did. That be conformed in the likeness of a son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined. Now that's a powerful statement. That he he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Amen to that. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. So he's saying, I'm predestined. God predestined that I would be his son. Amen to that? He predestined you. That was his plan, hallelujah, before creation. And he called me. You're here tonight because he called you, amen? And not only did he call you, but he justified you. He says, you are perfectly innocent, righteous, and holy, and pleasing in my sight. Not only are you justified, you're glorified. I'm telling you, you're seated in the heavenly realm at the right hand of the Father. Amen to that? That's who you are in Christ Jesus. What shall we say then in response to this? What am I going to say in response to this? Well, if God's for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, who can be against me? He who did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him, graciously give us all things. I've got God's favor on my life. Amen to that. The favor of God is on you. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? God is for me. Who can be against me? It is God who justifies I am justified not because I'm good enough. I'm justified not because I'm righteous enough. I'm justified because God said I am. Amen. <laughs> I am justified because of Him. Who is He that condemns? It ain't God. It's the devil. 
Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Jesus is interceding for you right now. Right now. He's speaking to the Father about you right now. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, think about that. Religion will do everything it can to separate you from Jesus. Your own sinful nature will do everything it can to separate you from Jesus. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or naked? Just because all this junk's going on, does that mean God loves me any less? Absolutely not. There's nothing that can separate me. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. Why not? Because God's in us. We're part of the family of God. We're part of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the king of kings, and everybody, every name must bow at the name of Jesus. And that king is living in my heart. Say amen to that. No, and all these things were more... I already know I'm one. It's already one. It doesn't matter how ugly it looks. It's, I'm winning. I'm the winner. You win. Jesus won it all for us. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why does he do it for you? He does it for you because he loves you. He loves you. And he died for you. He sacrificed his life for you. For I'm convinced, Paul says, I like what he, how he says that, I'm convinced. I got it settled in my heart that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, there's no power, say that with me, there's no power <laughs> that will separate me. Neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can separate you from God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I belong. Will you say that with me? I belong. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.14 shows us if we take ownership. For Christ's love compels us. Do you really know in the depth of your heart how much God loves you? Do you know in the depth of your heart how much God loves you? Paul says, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The evidence that I, I belong, the evidence that I have ownership, is that I no longer live for myself, but I live for him. You got to say amen to that? Let's just all stand and just thank the Lord for what he has done for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father God, you have made us so rich. Father God, I pray for spiritual revelation, spiritual knowledge and revelation in the depth of our hearts. Tonight that we will not walk away, not knowing in the depth of our hearts that we belong, that there is no doubt in our hearts. We renounce doubt in the name of Jesus. We renounce unbelief in the name of Jesus. We reject every lie of the devil, and we know that we are forgiven of all of our sins in the name of Jesus. Father, we do. We confess all of our sins, and we will not doubt it anymore but we accept your word and your word says we are washed in the blood of the lamb 
And we are forgiven of all of our sins. And I confess the sin, and I know many others do, of allowing ourselves to judge ourselves and condemn ourselves. We repent in Jesus' name because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We receive total forgiveness and we live as sons of the King, sons of God, because of what Jesus Christ has done. It is done, it is finished, we receive it, we accept it, and we stand in it, and we walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. I'm not sure what else to say to that. Praise God. So I had to think when we were, as we were standing there with our hands up, I had to think, you know, when you, even through worship, the word says that we raise our hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I have heard somebody say, it's like, when we have our hands up, it's, it's surrender, like if somebody would stick a gun in your back. <laughs> Surrender no, to God. So, surrender to that. You belong. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, I guess we'll let you go. Be blessed this week. And look forward to seeing you all next week.